Hey kids, today we are going to um, kind of wrap up our approximation methods um, under a curve. And I want to highlight that when you are asked to justify, and you do have to be asked, if you are dealing with your left hand rectangular approximation method or your right hand rectangular approximation method, when AP asks you to determine whether the estimates are too high or too low, when you choose, you are going to say too low because the function is increasing or decreasing. So if you are not sure, take a guess. Right. Anytime you are doing L or R RAM approximations, you can justify whether your estimate is too low or too high by simply stating whether your function increases or decreases over the interval. So hopefully that makes intuitive sense. Again, if I'm going to do L RAM on this increasing concave up, LRAM on this increasing concave down, it doesn't matter. It's just the fact that the function is increasing because when I start with the left hand and I don't again have to make my rectangles of even width, my rectangles are all under the curve. LRAM is too low for an underestimate, even if I am concave down, right? LRAM is too low. However, when my function is decreasing, and again, I have a decreasing concave up and a decreasing concave down, if I'm doing LRAM, right, here's an interval, LRAM start at the left side, you can see that LRAM is too high. Here's my interval, go up from the left endpoint. Right? Now let's do our RAM though. Our RAM on an increasing function, what is our RAM? On an increasing function, our RAM is too high. Doesn't matter if you're concave up or concave down. But what about decreasing? You're decreasing our RAM. You're going to start at the right end of the endpoint. First interval, I'm sorry. First interval, go to the right side. So for decreasing, our RAM, right, is the opposite. So when you are asked to justify, let's say I'm justifying this one, I would say my LRAM in estimate is too low because my function is increasing. If I was doing RRAM, RRAM is too high, too high because my function is increasing. LRAM is too high because my function is decreasing. Our RAM is too low because my function is decreasing. Now I'm making a big deal about that because we're gonna learn a new approximation method. And this new approximation method is not gonna depend, it's whether you're too high or too low, is gonna depend on another type of function behavior. For L and R RAM, whether your function is increasing or decreasing. Okay, picture the rectangle. All right, I also need to review or introduce some vocabulary, right? So still just review. 
When you're finding the area of the curve under the rectangles, I've used this language with you before. Georges Riemann came up with this notion. So your answer is called a Riemann sum. The width of each rectangle is called a subinterval of your domain. In this case, it would be delta t. And in this case, delta t is uniform, but it does not have to be. Oops, sorry. Subintervals do not all have to be the same size. A Riemann sum is a sum of products, and that's what you are doing, summing a bunch of products. Your Riemann sum is a bunch of areas of rectangles. You are summing areas of rectangles, right? That's the math notation for sum. But the area of rectangles is length times width, right? Or height times width. And our height is a function. And our width is the subinterval, right? Height comes from the function. Height of this rectangle comes from the function. Width comes from dt, and you're summing them all up. In this case, one, two, three, four of them. If you have subintervals of, of equal length, then each subinterval can be calculated by the distance between your stop and your start. If you're going to start making rectangles there and stop there, and you want four rectangles, you do stop minus start over the number of rectangles. I don't know why I have an apostrophe there. So in this case, delta x would be four minus zero over four, Delta X or Delta T would be one. Some more formal notation now. You don't have to write in this formal notation all the time, but you have to recognize it. The definite integral where you have a start and a stop is the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity. Starting with the first rectangle, ending with the infinite rectangle. These are your individual heights. The C sub K, right, is just an in, some individual C. C1, C2, C3, right, C0, if you want. Maybe I should make that one, two, three, four, whatever. These are individual domain values times delta X. Add them all up. Think about these widths getting infinitely small, infinitely small, so thin you can't tell, and then you would get the actual area if you take the limit. And remember, just like when you're doing why, why we needed limits with slopes, you can't divide by zero when you're doing a slope, so you do a limit as you go towards zero. You can't multiply by zero and get area because multiplying by zero makes the whole thing go away. You get zero. But if you take a limit and multiply times numbers that are really, 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 really close to zero, you get exact. And you need calculus to do that. Now, this is the Riemann notation. Georges came up with this, Georges Riemann. This is Riemann's notation. It's a little clunky. It's nice because it's very apparent what you're doing. I am taking a limit. As the number of rectangles goes to infinity, I am adding up heights times widths, which is area. Summing up a bunch of areas of rectangles, taking the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity. But Leibniz came along and he was like, ah, that's so 
Ah, right? Right? It's so pointy. Right? So many things going on. And he said, I have a more elegant notation. There is Leibniz's notation. I think I'm spelling his name right. So notice that with Leib Leibniz, Leibniz has replaced this cat capital sigma with this elegant integral sign, which is like a big stretchy out S for some, some. You still have your function heights, but indicating that the limit as the number of rectangles goes to zero is gonna shrink this delta X infinitely thin. This is your infinitely small width. A is where you start drawing rectangles and B is where you stop drawing rectangles. So A and B are domain values. They're either T in this case or they're X's. But I do want you to notice, and this is going to come back later, something that isn't as important right now but will be. If your function is in terms of X, then you are multiplying by domain values that are X values, and you are stopping at a domain value that is X and and starting one and stopping. Everybody is an X. Okay, or T's. So using a rectangular approximation method with four rectangles to approximate the area under this curve. The notation I would use for the exact area is Leibniz pretty curly S for some. The function times the infinitely thin widths of the domain t and I would start at t equals zero and I would stop at t equals four and no you don't have to write t equals there. I'm just doing it for emphasis sake. You could also write it like this. Right? The velocity, velocity function times infinitely thin intervals, subintervals of the domain, starting at zero and stopping at four. This would be the exact area, not an approximate. Now, you're not gonna know how to do this exact. You're not, I'm not gonna teach you till next unit how to actually get this exact area but I am gonna tell you how to use your calculator to get that number. Your calculator doesn't do calculus, but it, just like with derivatives, it gets, it's so fast and so quick and can do infinitely thin product, you know, rectangles, get their area and add them up very, very quickly. It's close enough. AP allows you, when they let you use your calculator, AP allows you to use this function of your calculator and say you are getting the exact area. Of course, you're not always gonna be allowed to use your calculator. All right, so that was a big wrap up for right now. And I will go, you know, I will tell you how to use that function on your calculator, I promise. But for right now, I wanna do another Riemann estimation. Remember, Riemann, just means a sum of products. And LRAM and RAM and MRAM were all products of areas of a rectangle. But I can do another Riemann sum and estimate the area under this curve. So it is my same function. I just changed the Ts to Xs. I'm gonna go from zero to four and there's my left-hand approximation, which you know from our previous discussion, since this function is increasing on zero to four, the left-hand approximation is going to be too low. 
and there is the approximate area. Notice that my delta x was 1. So these are all my right rectangle 1, 2, 3, and 4. Really, each of those is multiplied times, right? It has a delta x of 1. And I got 5 and said 5 and 3 quarters, which is too low. Here's the right hand approximation. And you know, since you're doing the right hand approximation and your function is increasing, right? These are this is just y of 1, y of 2, y of 3, and y of 4. Y of zero doesn't get to come to the R RAM party. And I got an approximation that was too high. Our best approximation was an average of the two. Do you remember that? Average. Kind of sort of like a slope of a secant. Linear. Do you see that? Averaging RAM and LRAM gave us our best estimate because it was closer. So we, if we take the average of each one of those, firstly, can you see now, can you see visually that our best estimate is too high? Can you see that? It's a little weird, but these lines indicating the average over each one of those intervals because the function is concave up. See the function is concave up. So each time it's a little bit under the average line. But I want you to look at the shape I have. Look at this, I'm gonna just use the largest one. Look at my last subinterval from three to four. You have the orange LRAM rectangle. You have the green RRAM rectangle. You have the average black line drawn over the interval three to four. If I fill in all of the area under that line, pretending that the function is not constant over three to four, but linear, what geometry shape is that? What is that? It's not a rectangle. <gasps> it's a trap. A zoid. <laughs> Did you see that coming? Oh, Admiral Akbar, RIP. Right? Love Admiral Akbar. It's a trap. A zoid. <laughs> I've taken the trapezoid and I've put it on its side. Can you tell me where delta x is? Delta x is there. Hey, I remember something from my geometry class. The area of a trapezoid is one half times the sum of the bases times the height. Look at what your bases are. Oops, I didn't want that to come up yet. Look at this base. What did they come from over here? Hey! <gasps> what is that? These are your function heights. Oh my gosh. One half comes from the fact that you have a little triangle on top of the rectangle. That's what makes the trapezoid, right? What is this? Not the function height, the height of this trapezoid. What is the height of this trapezoid? <gasps> what? What is happening? The things that Admiral Akbar knows. He knows a lot about traps. 
You just didn't think it was trapezoids, did you? <laughs> oh, Admiral Akbar. All right. So averaging the right and left trapezoids. I mean, sorry, averaging the right and left rectangles gave us the trapezoids is a trap. Oh, my lanta, what is that? Now I'm going to take that back away for a second because I know it's frightening. But I want you to see what I did here. How did I get this expression? I'm taking, I am summing a bunch of area of trapezoids. How many trapezoids do I have? Four trapezoids. Each one has a height of right? Height was really delta x, right? What was my delta x? One. One half comes from the trapezoid. So technically there is a one in front of here or on the other side, whatever. Because I have a uniform width, I can factor out the delta x out front. If I didn't, I would just keep it inside. And then what is this? the bases of the first trapezoid, y of zero and y of one times one times a half. That's one trapezoid. The second trapezoid comes from one half times one times Hey, didn't I just use that value? Mm. The sum of the bases. Where's the third trapezoid? One half times delta x times these two function heights. Notice no one gets left out of the trapezoid party. Not only does no one get left out, some of the function heights get to come to the party twice. Do you see that? Four trapezoids. Product, sum, Products, products because you're multiplying one times one half, right? You're summing a bunch of products. That is Riemann. That is a Riemann sum. Now I'm gonna put back the fancy language. You do not have to use the fancy language. Oh my Lanta, look at that. So what I did here was I made it very obvious. I use this in just in case my uniform, my delta T or delta X is not uniform, right? Each time I want you to see this formula. One half delta X times the sum of, sum of the bases. One half delta X times the sum of the bases. Four trapezoids. One, two, three, four. But look at what I have here. I can be a little bit more succinct with my trapezoidal rule because look what's happened with doubling up here. Wouldn't this be a little more elegant to write this way? Right? Do you see what I did there? Now don't forget your one half delta x. But that's because for each one of 
the trapezoids, the inside function heights is the left side of this rectangle, but the right side, I'm sorry, trapezoid, the right side of this trapezoid. So f of 1 was used twice, f of 2 was used twice, f of 3 was used twice, and the only ones that were used once was the very last and the very first, OMG. And again, this is still too high. Why? Why, why, why is this estimate still too high? Why is the trapezoid too high? Not because the function is increasing, because the function is concave down, ah, concave up. I'm over-exaggerating each piece. So when would the trapezoidal rule be too low? Right, when you're concave down. So here's what the trapezoidal world looks, trapezoidal rule looks like in a book where H is the width of your subinterval, which we can also call delta X. Right, and this is one half. And then you use the first Y value one time, the last Y value one time, and then all your middle y values twice. So this is how I think of it. One half height, one half times the height, but the height remember is delta x. Big parentheses, I write my first function value, my last function value, this is right where I stop, and where I start drawing trapezoids, plus two times, little parentheses, all the middle functions. That's how I think of the trapezoidal rule. It is a better approximation. It's what I made you do before when I just asked you in the over under handout. I just said the best. I didn't tell you it was the trapezoidal. You got the same number with the trapezoidal rule. So sure, if somebody asks you for the trapezoidal rule and you forget it, calculate the left, calculate the right, and average them, and you at least get your you at least get your answer point. But if they ask you to set up the trapezoidal rule, you must. The trapezoidal rule is not the same thing as MRAM. Not, not, not. I mean, unless your function's linear. Right? Does that make sense? The trapezoidal estimate, the trapezoidal rule estimate is too high if the function is concave up, right? And I hinted at this before. Unlike LRAM and RRAM, the behavior that determines whether the trapezoidal rule is too high or too low is concavity. All right. We will practice uh, some of the trapezoidal rules in uh, some examples with the trapezoidal rule in our live session. I will see you then.